and each student in front of me today has added their own unique chapter to this growing story. Ladies and gentlemen, university is difficult and it is stressful and it is long and I don't have to tell our graduating students that they know that they've experienced that. But sometimes for the family and friends, uh, particularly if they do not have a university degree themselves, it's difficult to understand maybe what their relatives and friends have gone through. But many students, of course, have relocated hundreds and thousands of kilometres to study here, living behind their country, their homes, their family and their friends. Some have had to adjust to a new culture, a new city, a new way of life in a language that isn't easily learned. Some of you have had to study knowing that your families have made a huge sacrifice to have you here, and that puts additional pressure on you. And most of you will have lost countless hours of sleep and maybe a bit of your sanity on the way through your studies. And almost all of you will have sacrificed quality time with your family back home. Every graduating student here today has demonstrated great commitment and dedication and persistence. Otherwise you would not be here. Along the way you've had victories and successes, but maybe you've also had setbacks and failures. But all of those things taken together have brought you here today and equipped you well for the future. The university's motto is Doctrina Perpetua, or forever learning. And I think our graduating students here today know that although this is a very, very important milestone in their lifetime, that there will very likely be other educational milestones as their careers unfold. Research shows that a new graduate today will change career five times within his or her working life. Just think about that. And additional training will most likely be required in a new technical stream, management, commerce and so on. And clearly we would be delighted to have you back if you wish to do any further studies. To those graduates I say once again very warm congratulations from the Council and the University community and I wish you all well for your futures. Thank you. Mr. Chancellor, what a miserable looking bunch of students. You're all sitting there with frowns on your face. Small but you're the ones that passed. You do know that, that you're coming up to get your degree today. You're the ones that got through. But you're all sitting there looking really worried. I mean, what are you worried about? What could happen? I guess if you're wearing high heel shoes, something nasty could happen, or if you were wearing hats that were just balanced on, something funny could happen, so perhaps you should be looking worried. Yeah, maybe. Look, congratulations to everyone here today. As the Chancellor said, you are an absolutely incredible uh, bunch of people. We know that many of you have come from all around the world to study in a language that wasn't your own language, to study in a culture that wasn't your own culture, and to study a degree that is exactly the same standard and level as our degrees on all of our campuses through Australia, and exactly the same standard as any university in Australia. You have done an incredible thing. But we also have uh, students here from Australia. We have Australian students here. You're an incredible bunch as well, because we know that you have not taken a traditional route through university. Most of you have studied with us through distance education. We know that you've had family commitments. We know you've had work commitments. But you too have persevered and have gone here to graduation today. A fantastic achievement. Well done. Can I tell you just a little about your university? Because this will always be your university from now on. One of the things that we really pride ourselves on in the university is that we are one of Australia's most innovative universities. 
And I could tell you many hundreds of things that we're doing in innovation. I could tell you some of the research we're doing, some of the cloning research, some of the research we're doing in engineering. But I don't really want to talk about that this afternoon. I want to talk about something that happened actually long before I came to the university. It was when our university that was born in central Queensland decided that it really had something to give uh, to the world. Its standards of education and what it did in education, it really wanted to give that to a lot of students from around the world. It was also very aware that really we wouldn't be able to attract lots and lots of international students to central Queensland. And if we really wanted to share what we had in education with international students, we would have to go to where they wanted to be, which was the big metropolitan centres, Sydney, Melbourne, Brisbane and the Gold Coast. So the university set up campuses uh, in those cities. And it did more than that. It actually set up a completely different kind of management structure to manage those campuses and it established a company called C Management Services, CMS. Now some of you will be aware of CMS and some of you won't be aware of CMS because CMS operates in the background. It manages the campuses and it gives support to the students. It was an incredibly innovative uh, development in its time. This is a very special graduation today because this is the last ever graduation that we will have at the university that has been organised and run by CMS. And I just want to pay tribute to that company, a company that's worked for the university, that has meant that many people from around the world have come and had a quality education and then gone out to have absolutely stunning careers. This is the last graduation that's organised by CMS because CMS is coming to an end. CMS was a fantastic organisation for its time. We have now decided to combine the university completely and the campuses, all campuses of the university, will be run directly to, by the university. But I would like to thank my colleagues here from CMS for all the work that they have done over the years, all the time they have given, and acknowledge the absolute incredible impact that they have had on people from all around the world. So, thank you, CMS. graduating students to have you here today. So I'd like to thank you on behalf of them for being here and supporting them today on this really special, special day. But most of my comments I'm going to talk about is to the students. Because what I want to say to you is, is today I want you to take your time, if you're probably a bit nervous and thinking what's going on, speeches and, and all this stuff. But on the 6th of May, two weeks ago, I was sitting in a position or standing on a parade ground like yourselves for my graduation ceremony. And, and it was 30 years ago. And every day of my career since, I've remembered every moment of that like it was yesterday. And that's got me through some really interesting times. So I want you to remember today everything that's said, every moment, enjoy, because in years to come, you will draw on that as a, as a significant milestone in your life. So really take your time, take a deep breath, and sit back and, and enjoy the ride today. What do you think? And I they brought a cop along. What's a cop going to speak about? Well, sometimes I don't know until I get here. And, and I got here today, and some of the, the words that the chance from the vice chancellor made me think about today is life changing for you. And, and you say to yourself, well, how's that going to be? And, and sometimes you won't even know how your life is going to change. But more importantly. Each of you here have already shown the commitment, the passion, the dedication and the effort to change lives. That you all should have shown that every one of you in some way have the potential to change other people's lives, which is more important than someone's changing our own. And on that basis, I thought I'd share with you 
today just a, a brief story of some people that taught me that you don't have to be the smartest, the brightest, the prettiest, the most handsome, the richest to change lives. So I'm going to share with you a story today about two people that changed my life professionally and personally forever. And just when you've got a bit of downtime, think about this and maybe draw on it. Well, I'm going to take you back in time to 1986. In 1986, I was working at a place called Blacktown. Is anyone here from the western suburbs? <laughs> Hands up. Oh, yes. Well, see, I'm a Westie. Born and bred at Parramatta, live at Parramatta, and go for Parramatta. Probably one of the very few that can say that. <laughs> but when I first joined the cops, I worked at Blacktown. And in 1986, something happened in Blacktown that changed the lives of many people, but also me. And it changed my life professionally and personally. And I'm going to talk to you about the professional side first. In 1986 at Blacktown, there was a murder. A murder that got a lot of publicity straight away. It was a murder of a nurse, a nurse called Anita Cobby. Anita Cobby was a, a girl, she was working at Sydney Hospital. She finished work on a Sunday afternoon, had dinner with friends, called the train back to Blacktown where she was living with her mum and dad. And as she got off the train, she would do one of two things. She'd put 20 cent pieces in a phone box to call her dad to pick her up, or she'd catch a taxi home. It was about two kilometres away. <coughs> on this afternoon, it was about 20 to 8, it's February in 1986, a warm night, just going on dark, and she noticed that the 20 cents were all jammed in the phone box. That dates me, doesn't it? She didn't have mobile phones in those days. And the taxi rank was full. So she thought she'd walk home. When she was about 500 metres from home, a car containing five criminals did a U-turn because they wanted to do a, a robbery or take, take some money to buy some alcohol and some cigarettes. And after they stopped to drag her bag, they thought, no, we can do more than that. So they dragged her into the car, took her to a paddock, took, her, took all the clothes off, all of them raped her, and then cut her throat and killed her. The man in charge of that inquiry was a detective sergeant called Graham Rosetta. He looked like a detective should look. He didn't wear purple. He was tough. He talked out the side of his mouth like a detective should talk. <laughs> and I don't know if you know this, but most murders are committed by people known to the victim, about 88, 90%. And they're the ones the police normally will solve in time. The murders of people that are done randomly are the ones the detectives find really hard to solve. And in fact, it's people from the community who will give us the information to solve those types of murders. On this occasion, the man in charge of that investigation, Graham Rosetta, identified that Anita Cobby's murder was one of those random murders. And he also identified that very soon the media were going to walk away and therefore the chances of solving this crime were remote. Faced with this pressure, he could walk past me one day in the station where I was a young constable answering a switchboard and he stopped and he looked at me. He said, Wallace, how old are you? 24, Sergeant. How tall are you? Five foot eight, Sergeant. He said, good, perfect, come with me. And the come with me was he decided to do something that had never been done before. He decided to dress me up in clothes similar to what she wore on her last night and to do a reenactment of her last few hours, hoping that someone out there in the, in the community would recognise the scenario, it would get some media attention because it was a gimmick, and maybe that breakthrough would come, that person out there could do something. They dressed, they dressed me up on the train and I walked in that train walk, and after I did that, Graham Rosetta took me to the, the basement of the police station and looked at me and said, how would you like to be a detective? And I thought to myself, I must have walked good on that train. Now he didn't know whether I was ever going to be a detective, but he allowed me to stay with the investigation team. And what I saw, I wasn't prepared for, because I saw another level of passion, commitment, dedication, determination, and hard work. All those qualities that each of you have shown today. And I remember thinking way back then, because being a woman in the western suburbs in the 80s is a bit, a bit testing. 
I wonder if I would be one of them. And so today, when people ask me, when I get what got my APM, was I proud? Yes. And when I became um, a sergeant, was I proud? And a superintendent, yes. And a chief inspector, was I proud? And they say to me, which was the proudest moment? And I said, it was the, the 10th of September, 1989. And people say, what happened on that day? And I said, well, that was the day I got my piece of paper, the paper is similar to what you're going to get today, that said I was now a detective. And from that day forward, it changed my life in that then I was always going to be a detective. How did it change my life personally? I remember going out the day after the body was found to tell a parent the worst news you could tell a parent, and that is their child had been found naked, raped, throat cut in a paddock at Blacktown. As the two detectives, the senior detectives, approached the front door, the dad opened the door, Gary Lynch. And before the detectives could say a word, he simply looked into their eyes and he said these words. I wish you would tell me it's someone else's daughter that you found me out there. But I'm glad you're not going to do that. I'm glad you're going to tell me it's my daughter. Because if it was someone's daughter out there in that paddock, then another family would have to live through what we're about to embark upon. It's best it's us. I got to look into the eyes of pure strength, humanity and humility. A few moments later, I got to look in those eyes again in the form of Grace Lynch, the mum. Because as we went inside, at this point, the detectives made a mistake. A mistake that Gary and Grace lived with all their lives. But that we, and now you, as members of New South Wales, the community, have benefited from. Because with the best of intentions, the detectives said to Gary and Grace, we now have to go down and identify the body. Grace went to get a handbag, and with the best of intentions, the detective said to her, no, no, you stay here with Deb. She's, we brought her along to make you a nice cup of tea. It's better you remember your daughter the way she was, not the way she is today. The detectives underestimate the strength of a woman and the strength of a mother. She never got over the fact she didn't get to say goodbye to her daughter. But she vowed that would never happen again to another family. And that one moment in time, these two very humble people from Blacktown, very average community people, became the founding members of what's today known as, 30 years on, as the Victims of Homicide Support Group. So today, when a murder happens, the detectives arrive, the forensics arrive, and someone from that group will come and give advice to the detectives on what the family need and what the family need to do within the process. What Graham did with that reenactment was right. The day after the reenactment, the information from the community came in and the five killers were identified and charged. When they were when they went to trial and convicted, the judge sentencing them to sentenced them to never to be released. The scenes in the courtroom, everyone stood as one and cheered and high five. Out of Blacktown, people were running down the streets, high fiving and hugging. Justice had been done. Gary and Grace, these two very simple people, stood in the courtroom that day and bowed with respect to the judge, thanking him for everything he had done to bring the killers to justice. On the way back in the car, they were quiet. And I said, what's wrong? You two will be quiet and you'll be overwhelmed with the sentence. They said, no, we're worried. I said, what are you worried about? We're worried that in time, someone will come along when we're dead and say, well, never to be released, that's not really humane. People should know how long they get to serve sentences. And so that group with the homicide because of crime lobbied the government, the government listened, and laws were changed because of them. Today we have new laws called truth and sentencing. So today we hear of laws and sentences like 32 years, 16 years, 18 years. The five killers of Anita Cobby have been brought back to court and re under this law to life without parole. They will never walk amongst us again. I remember saying to them, well, you've got to be happy now. Everything's fixed. And Gary said, no, not really. I thought, oh, here we go again. Now what? He said, well, we had a high profile case. But what about the average citizen, the people, victims of sexual assault, robberies, break and enters? Who has a say on who gets out on parole? Because at the time, bureaucrats did, people from government. So Gary felt that wasn't right, they lobbied the government, the government listened, and laws were changed again. 
and today it's legislated there must always be a member of the community or a victim of crime sitting on every parole board hearing to say who gets out or not. About three years ago, Gary got quite sick and he was in a nursing home at Blacktown and he had good days and bad days and with absolute clarity on this afternoon on Saturday, he was 90 years old, he looked at me and his wife Grace and with absolute clarity he said to us, well girls, you've had me long enough you know, I think you've been spoiled. It's time I go and see Anita because she misses me and I miss her and we're going to have a bit of a talk. But don't worry, I'll be seeing you all again soon, so just relax. And we saw what Gary's having a moment. And three hours later, he quietly passed away in his sleep. Today I got the news that Grace, 87, has been admitted to Paladin Clean at Mount Druid, suffering from lung cancer. She's done her last day at home. And I looked into her eyes and she said, you know, it's sad, dear, really. I said, what's sad? And she said, your brain outlives your body sometimes, but it's time. It's time I go very soon and see Gary and Anita and keep them company. And you know what I think sometimes when I'm having a bad hair day, girls will know about this, and our pants don't fit, I think back to Gary and Grace. And I thank them for all the contribution they've made to us as a society and to me personally. And you think to yourselves, can I do this? Every one of you have achieved so much greatness so far. Imagine what you can do when you really put your minds to it. And I'll leave you with this sort of words of a, of a sociologist from Canada called Margaret Mead. And it sums up to me what Gary and Grace represent and all of you have the potential to represent. Never doubt that a small group of dedicated, committed people can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever does. So congratulations to you all. All the best for the future. I know amongst you we've got world leaders and politicians, I'll have to but people that would go to leaders in industry. And I'm, I'm so honoured as a, as a cop working on the streets of Sydney to be here to share this wonderful, prestigious, special day with you all. Congratulations. We'll see you on the next day.
brings me up to more than I can be.
I will use this opportunity to shed some light on the experience we had during our time at Sydney campus of Sydney University. We all might have witnessed that in life there are always events to look forward to and occasions that pass by, but only few are able to leave a notable impact. For us as students, these memorable times include receiving such a warm welcome on our orientation day, preparing ourselves as a team for a group presentation, spending hours at the campus library searching for that one magical reference that was seal the deal, the laughter and excitement that came hand in hand with the recreational activities on and off campus, such as the end of term parties and Melbourne Craft Celebration, and of course, the jubilation of finding your picture on the honor board. For some of us, it was an achievement in itself when we began to learn how to balance our work and student life in a whole new independent environment. At the same time, missing the presence of our families living thousands of miles away. It was these and many other unforgettable experiences in CQ University that have transformed into a colorful bouquet of long-lasting memories that will not only continue to groom our personalities in upcoming professional and academic life, but will also inspire us to strive for excellence. This cannot be concluded without offering our gratitude towards the academic as well as administrative staff of our university for their extraordinary support and guidance throughout our studies. Even though the students of CQU represent one of the best examples of multiculturalism, we all enjoy the same density of love, motivation, and constant provision from our friends and families, making us strong enough to achieve our goal with pride and dignity. We thank you from the bottom of our heart for believing in us and for helping us to achieve this milestone. Having said that, I would also like to suggest that our journey here has not finished yet. There is still a long distance to cover. More efforts are desired to turn talent into skills, knowledge into practice, excellence into brilliance, and to turn life itself into meaning. As graduates, we are expected to be the leaders of tomorrow. So rather than going with the flow, we should be what we want to be and know that sky is the limit. Leaving you on this high note, I would like to congratulate all the graduating students on their biggest achievement so far, wishing each and every one of you a successful and prosperous life ahead. Lastly, on behalf of all the graduates, I would like to thank our guest speaker, Deborah Wolves for inspiring us and for sharing with us some words of wisdom and would like her to accept this small gift as a token of our appreciation. I thank you all. I ask all graduates to please stay. I charge you as graduates of CQ University Australia to commit to lifelong strive for truth, integrity and compassion, to contribute to your chosen profession and by the application of your abilities, to support and nurture the communities of which you are a part. May your rewards bring honour to your university, to your chosen profession and to yourselves. Good luck.
Опыт работы? Да, почему на 5? Здесь? Нет, нет, в России. Опыт работы в России. Надо подтверждать, правильно? Ты можешь просто прийти, что у меня есть опыт работы. Ну, нужны же справки из России. И, между прочим, нужно, чтобы это соответствовало тому, что ты уже подавалась. Ты не можешь вдруг, как это... На что подавалась? Когда ты сюда на студенческую подавалась, у тебя... Нет, ну это окей. Ну, просто можно подтвердить. Ну так иди. И я хочу. Сейчас я пойду. Сумку отдай. С ними хочешь? Давай, дай я так буду Я давайте... Просто... Вы, вы, вы это.